I want to invite you to turn to Genesis chapter 38. Genesis chapter 38. Hopefully you have a copy of God's Word. If you don't have a copy of God's Word, we have some Bibles in the back for you to take one, own it, read it. Uh, if you'd rather f follow along digitally, there's a QR code on the seat back in front of you. Would you scan that QR code? Make your way to Genesis chapter 38. Genesis chapter 38. We're in this teaching series titled Joseph. We kicked it off last week, Joseph, with chapter 37. And chapter 38 will seem a little odd, a little out of place, but uh, in the sovereignty of God, I assure you it's not. <laughs> There's a diversion that we find in chapter 38. As we consider the series as a whole, Joseph beginning in chapter 37. Most scholars speak to the contrast. The importance of chapter 38 is because there's a stark contrast between Joseph and his other brothers. There's a stark contrast. Joseph was a man of an integrity, never complained, never compromised. And what we see in the lives of his brothers is compromised after another, is after another, that's Surely see in chapter 38. I hope you brought your, your seat belts. Hope you brought them out of your car and you just put it on. Put it on. We're going to go for a ride today. It's going to be a little wild, chapter 38. We have an incredible kids ministry. Incredible discovery kids ministry. And I'm just going to preach the Bible. And so I'm just going to kind of say it that way. And as we get into chapter 38, I guess you decide what conversations you're going to have later on at home. Praise God. After chapter 38, look at verse 1 with me. At that time, Judah left his brothers and settled near an Adolamite named Hira. Let's pause in verse 1 here. At that time, as we're studying the Word of God, we study for the context. What is the context? God, what is your Word saying? What is it saying? And so there's key words as you read the Word of God. I pray that uh, as a church, we don't just read for just more information, but it's the transformation. God, what is your Word saying and how must I apply it? And so as we're studying the Word of God and we study context, there's key words, and time is always a key word. I would encourage you to somehow circle it, underline it, note, take note of it. Time always tells. Time is important. We all have different defining moments in our life, and we look back. I mean, you consider when you surrendered your life over to Jesus. Now, you might not know the, the, the specific day or the specific hour, but surely you know around about when your life was radically changed, when you were brought from death into life. And you look back and, and you praise God for how far you've come when your life was headed to destruction and death. There's different defining moments in all of our lives, and and we see one here at that time. So what's happening? What's the context? You see in chapter 37 that Joseph has been sold to the Ishmaelites by his brothers. That Joseph, uh, was his death was being plotted by his brothers as he's wearing this robe of many colors. And he's approaching Othan. He's approaching where they're pasturing the flocks in Dothan. They see him from a distance and what do they say? They're conspiring to kill him. We continue the chapter 37, and you see that they, rather than killing him, they sold him into slavery. They sold him to the Ishmaelites. Then the last verse of chapter 37, what do you see? That he has been sold from the Ishmaelites in Egypt to Potiphar. So we pause there. Next week, we're going to pick up the close of chapter 37, beginning of chapter 39. We'll pick up where it's left off. At that time, Judah left his brother, settled near an Adolamite named Hira. So Judah doesn't return with the rest of his brothers. The rest of his brothers return to their father, Jacob. There's mourning, there's, there's loss, they've deceived. If you remember, they, they deceived Jacob. And so they return. But Judah doesn't return. At that time, Judah settles away from his family. Judah settles in a foreign area, a pagan area, where ungodly practices. Judah makes the decision to surround himself with people of pagan worship rather than his father worship the one true and living God. Verse, verse 2. There Judah saw the daughter of a Canaanite named Shua. Everyone say Shua. 
He took her as a wife and slept with her. She conceived and gave birth to a son, and he named him Ur. Everyone say Ur. She conceived again, gave birth to a son, and named him Onan. Everyone say Onan. She gave birth to another son and named him Shelah. Everyone say Shelah. It was a at Ch Ch uh, Chezeb that she gave birth to him. Lots of crazy names. <laughs> Judah settles elsewhere. He marries a Canaanite. Again, that's the insight to a, a pagan worship. He marries a paganite named who? Shua. Okay, you're not with me. Shua. He, 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 names a, he marries a woman named who? Shua. All right, three people are with me now. And, and then they have three sons. Three sons. Three sons. Ur, Onan, and Shelah. Three sons. Ur, Onan, and Shelah. Look at verse 6. Judah got a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. Everyone say Tamar. That's, that's going to be an important one. Now Ur, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the Lord's sight, and the Lord put him to death. Ju Judah got a wife for his firstborn son. Notice the firstborn son. It wasn't the secondborn first. It was the firstborn. Why is that? It, it, it was all about the family lineage. The inheritance would flow down. And so the father wanted to make sure that the firstborn son would have a, a, a wife and they would have children so that the, the family line would continue. And so we see, we see that Judah finds Ur, a wife, and her name is Tamar. And Ur does something wicked. Now, we don't know what he does that is wicked. We're, we're going to see what Onan does that is wicked. But, but Ur does something that is wicked. By the way, this is the first mention of God killing someone because of wickedness. We've mentioned these the first as we've looked through the entire book of Genesis up to this point. First battles, first sin, I mean, all this first. And, and so... This is the first mention that God kills someone because of wickedness. So he does something wicked. We don't know what it is that he does, but we know that he does something. God kills him. And then uh, we go to verse 8. Then Judah said to Onan, sleep with your brother's wife. Perform your duty as her brother-in-law. And produce offspring for your brother. But Onan knew that the offspring would not be his. So whenever he slept with his brother's wife, he released his semen on the ground so that he would not produce offspring for his brother. What he did was evil in the Lord's sight. So he put him to death also. So Ur marries Tamar. He does something wicked. And he's taken out. So then it's own its responsibility. Why? Because of the importance of continuing the family line. It's important that Onan Tamar his wife and to sex put it that way So he dies. This was or he dies. Now listen, Onan was supposed to provide so that the inheritance came. There's a Deuteronomy we, we find added to the law. It's becomes a it's called the Leverate marriage. The Leverate marriage. And this is a living brother takes the widow to produce a child or children to protect the inheritance. This is what Judah is asking him to do. Deuteronomy chapter 25 verse 5 says, When brothers live on the same property and one of them dies without a son, the wife of the dead man may not marry a stranger outside the family. Her brother-in-law is to take her as his wife, have sexual relations with her, and perform the duty of a brother-in-law for, for her. Now, praise God, this was part of the old covenant. Can I get a name in? Because that would be wild if it was still, still trying to practice it. Some of y'all are thinking, oh, praise Jesus. I mean, it says, no. you didn't even know what's going on here. So Onan, Judah asked Onan to, to step up. 
And Onan does halfway. Best described as this. Sexual gratification without parental responsibility. That's what we see take place here with Onan. Sexual gratification without parental responsibility. Why? Onan didn't want to give Tamar's son her because of the firstborn. He didn't want to do it. Gratification. Parental responsibility. This isn't something of just the Old Testament. This is what we are experiencing today. There's a whole lot of people wanting to fulfill free or because it's my life, buddy. And what God has called us to is protect what he's instituted. And what God has is this beautiful thing we call marriage. What God has designed within the marriage between a man and a woman under this covenant, exchanging vows with one another, but before God, sex is, God has designed for two reasons that I will list today and perhaps more. But the first is that the two become one. That you're drawn into a greater intimacy. That that intimacy is, is experienced between made a commitment to for the rest of your life. Here with just anyone. And our world has perverted what God has created. Sex is to draw the husband and wife together experience a closeness and intimacy. It's beautiful. Secondly, God designed sex to produce offspring. To fill this earth. And the children in your homes, they are gifts from God. And you are called to disciple to love, to help shape them, to teach them. And so I wonder, when they look at your marriage, are they aspiring for the same in, in theirs one day? What do they see when they see how you talk to each other, how you treat each other? First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18 says this, Flee sexual morality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. Don't you know, verse 19, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. Verse 20, for you were bought at a high price. You were bought at a high price, so glorify God with your body were bought with a high price. What is that high price? It was the precious blood of Jesus. The high price that you and I were bought. We were, our sin was paid for. This body is not Tim O'Carroll's. It's the Lord's. Your body is not yours. It's the Lord's. He's the creator of all things. He is the creator of all things. We're called a flea. Sexual morality. Sexual gratification. Sexual gratification. And the church must rise up. The church must rise up and no longer be silent. Verse 11, Genesis chapter 38. Then Judah said to his daughter in law, Tamar, Remain a widow in your father's house. 
until my son Sheila grows up. For he thought he might die too, like his brothers. So Tamar went to live in her father's house. So, so you see what's happening in verse 11. Judah didn't want a third son to die. The first son died. The second son died. He's like, oh, I got I to gotta protect something here. I got to protect something here. And so, so he tells Tamar to go live with her family. And when Sheila grows up, th then the two will be married. He says, when the son gets older, and this was an excuse. It was never his intention. It was never Judah's intention of fulfilling the promise. Look at verse 12. After a long time, you, you see that again, after a long time, Judah's wife, the daughter of Shua, died. When Judah had finished mourning, he and his friend Hira the Adolamite went up to Timnah to his sheep shears. Uh, Tamar was told, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. So she took off her widow's clothes, veiled her face, covered herself, and sat at the entrance of Enam, which is on the way to Timnah. For she saw that, though Sheila had grown up, she had not been given, him, given to him as a wife. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. He went over to her and said, come, let me sleep with you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, what will you give me for sleeping with me? Verse 17, I'll send you a young goat from my flock, he replied. And she said, only if you leave something with me until you send it. What should I give you, he asked. She answered, your signet ring, your cord, and the staff in your hand. So he gave them to her and slept with her, and she became pregnant by him. She got up and left, then removed her veil and put her widow's clothes back on. So, so Judah mourns the death of his wife, Shua. He travels to Timnah to, to visit a pagan friend and with his pagan friend to shear some sheep. Tamar hears of the plans. She's already ticked because... Judah hasn't given her his third son, Sheila. And she said, man, I'm, I'm going to give me his son one, one way or another here. She comes up with this plan. He sees this prostitute. And he gives the three most precious gifts as a down payment to have sex with her. Now, many things can be said about what we just read. One is this, church, you, you must choose your friends and influences wisely. Judah should have been home with his father. But he settles elsewhere. And he takes and forms a friendship with Hira, a man of a different worship in a different way of life. He surrounds himself with someone that doesn't share the same values of what he grew up with. Tamar disguises herself as a temple prostitute. This is a part of the Canaanite Worship. This is how the Canaanites got converts. Seems like a good way in a perverted world, right? To get converts. Hey, come to the temple. <laughs> Sleep with whoever you want. But it's a complete perversion. But nonetheless, this is how their membership grew, if you will. So she dresses up. He gives these that are most precious to him. The signet ring. What is the signet ring? This is the, the reminder and the stamp, uh, the symbol of authority of one over the household. And he gives this as a down payment. The cords. Uh, what are the cords? Other translations might read bracelets. The, the bracelets that he would have worn that have different engravings. They're precious to him. He gives this as a down payment. And then his staff. That staff would have would have been through many battles and that staff would have been marked 
memorializing these different battles. And that staff, all these were to be passed on to the, to the next upon Judah's death. And he gives these most precious to him as a down payment. Look at verse 20. When Judah sent the young goat by his friend, the Adolamite, in order to get the in order to get back the items he had left with the woman, he could not find her. He asked the men of the place, where is the cult prostitute who was beside the road at Enam? There has been no cult prostitute here, they answered. So the Adolamite returned to Judah saying, I couldn't find her. And besides, the men of the place said, there has been no cult prostitute here. Verse 23, Judah replied, let her keep the items for herself. Otherwise, we will become a laughing stock. After all, I did send this young goat, but you couldn't find her. So Judah tries to get back, get his belongings back, his precious belongings. He sends the young goat. Ahira can't find Tamar. And he says, okay, at this point, Judah is more concerned about his reputation than doing the right thing. He says, I, I, don't, I don't want to be the laughing stock. He's more concerned about his reputation than doing the right thing. Look at verse 24. About three months after Judah was told your daughter-in-law, Tamar, has been acting like a prostitute and now she is pregnant. Bring her out, Judah said, and let her be burned to death. This is Judah's response. What we see here is we often highlight other sin to hide our sin. Oh, it's easy. It's easy to throw that stone at somebody else because you surely don't want the stone thrown at you. And Judah calls for her death knowing that near Timnah he slept with the prostitute. Knowing what he had done, he calls for her life, for her to be burned to death. Look at verse 25. As she was being brought out, she sent her father-in-law this message. I am pregnant by the man to whom these items belong. And she added, examine them. Whose signet ring, cord, and staff are these? T Tamar, he ain't no dummy. <laughs> she, she had this thing planned. Judah recognized them. Can you, can you imagine? I mean, I can just see it. All junk. <laughs> and said, she is more in the right than I, since I did not give her to my son, Sheila. And he did not know her intimately again. Tamar sends this message. Hey, examine these. Who do they belong to? Judah knows. I mean, I don't know how long he spent looking at these items. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Examine them fully. But he knows. He recognized them, the text says in verse 26. And this is what he said. For the very first time that we can see, he's being honest. She is more in the right than I. Do you see that? She is more in the right than I. He knew all along. He promised to give his third son, Sheila, but it was a promise he was never going to fulfill. She is more in the right than I. In a culture that pushes blame easily, in a culture that doesn't own to mistakes, that wants to brush them under the rug and run from them, hope they just disappear. Can I tell you that the church of Jesus needs to rise up and own our mistakes and own our failures and surrender them at the foot of the cross and trust, trust Jesus for the forgiveness and for the future and for freedom, to trust him for it. You, you can keep running from your past, Church, you, you can keep running from your failures. You can keep running from your mistakes. This is what Judah's doing. Why did he settle elsewhere? Because he's running. 
He's running. And you can keep running. But the past isn't going to disappear. You, you can reset the, the history viewing on your computer. But the past isn't going to disappear. You got to come to the point where you own your mistakes. And you surrender them to the Lord Jesus. And receive the forgiveness that only comes through Christ, we, we, must, we must own our mistakes. Jesus is the only one that provides the healing that we need, the forgiveness that we need, the peace that we need, the future that we long for. It is only found in Jesus. It's time to own, own the mistakes. Surrender them at the foot of the cross. Look at uh, verse 27 to the close of this chapter. When the time came, again, as a the fourth mention of time just in this one chapter. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twins in her womb. Not just one, but two. You ever, get that, you ever got that call? We got a couple people in our church. That is a life, I mean, one is a life-changing call, but two is like, oh man. <laughs> what in the world just happened? Well, oh, here we go. Verse 28. As she was given birth, one of them, put out his hand and the midwife took it and tied a scarlet thread around it announcing this one came out first verse 29 but then he pulled his hand back out came his brother and she said what a breakout you have made for yourself so he was named Perez then his brother who had the scarlet thread tied on his hand came out and was named Zira. What a crazy end. I mean, I, I give all the mamas props anyways. I, I can guarantee the fellas are, are, are definitely the wusses in the house. I give all the mamas some props. You, your strength it is incredible. But can you imagine being this mama? I mean, a hand comes out. <laughs> I won't spend too much time there. They, they, they wrap the scarlet thread to signify that this is the firstborn because that's important, right? The family line will continue through the firstborn. And then the, the hand goes back in. Crazy. I mean, painful. That's how I, I, I don't, I'm losing words. What a mess. I mean, literally, in every shape and form, from start to finish, Judah's life is a, it's a life of failure. From start to finish, it's, it's failure. But here's the man that was a part of conspiring to kill his own brother. And to make them feel better about themselves they said we won't kill them we'll sell them into slavery I mean maybe a touch better but not much he doesn't go home he settles elsewhere he surrounds himself with people that are gonna be the yes people maybe some of you got those yeah you just keep doing what you're doing you just keep flirting with that other person you just keep talking about these kind of sexual jokes and it's all good you know Hey, you need some no people in your life, church. You need some people that are going to stand the ground and hold you accountable. They're going to say, no, 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 you're not walking down the path that God has for you. You're straying. You're straying. You're straying hard. You need to come back. I I'm convinced that the, the church, when, when accountability is within the church, it's a beautiful thing. That's where the growth comes from. And some of y'all, if you're honest, you're just running. You're, you're running from community because if they only knew... And here's what we'll say as we begin to close. Is that is the first step. Honesty is the first step to healing. Honesty is the first step to healing. Judah finally gets honest. And then these two are born. And God has been in the middle of the mess the entire time. As I've already said, nothing bad is recorded about Joseph. Joseph. But Judah and his brothers' lives are a mess. 
Joseph was faithful. We're going we're gonna to see that next week and on. Joseph was faithful. His brothers were failures. Joseph had solid integrity. His brothers, his brothers had practiced sinful morality. Yet in the midst of it all, in the midst of the mess, the Holy Spirit is working behind the scenes using the most unlikely people to bring the Messiah, that is Jesus Christ, into the world. And here's really the takeaway from this chapter, all the Bible, your story, my story, is that God can take the most broken situations and turn them into something beautiful. God can take the most broken situations and turn them into something beautiful. Matthew chapter one, as we close, Matthew chapter one, we find the genealogy of Jesus. It's, it's the timeline. It's the family line all the way to his birth. Man, I'm excited to celebrate here in just a month or so. Chapter 1, verse 1 says, An account of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Verse 2, Abraham fathered Isaac. Isaac fathered Jacob. Jacob fathered Judah and his brothers. Judah fathered Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Aram. And you can continue to read all the way through to the birth of Christ. To Jews, genealogy is a high priority. It's a high priority to Jews. It should be to us as well. Where'd you come from? But to the Jews, it's particularly a high priority. In chapter 1 of Matthew, what we find is five different women mentioned. Five different women. The first is the Mary, the mother of Jesus. Can you imagine being Mary? We're going to talk about that more here in a few weeks. But can you imagine just being Mary? young teen immaculate conception like all the rumors all the scuttlebutt going around but hearing clearly from God and following through in obedience if you work backwards the, the second woman you'll find mentioned is Bathsheba now chapter 1 writes Uriah's wife that's Bathsheba Bathsheba, you, you remember the story of Bathsheba? She's bathing next, next to David's palace one day. I mean, she is naked. He's supposed to be at war. He's left his own people. He's in disobedience. He looks over and sees a naked Bathsheba. He leaves his home. Has sex with Bathsheba. He wants her. He sends her husband Uriah to the front line, essentially killing him. But that's Bathsheba. The third, the third woman is, is Ruth. The third woman is, is Ruth. You, you know the story of Ruth, the book of the Ruth, book of Ruth in the Old Testament. Ruth is a, a Moabite widow that, that marries Boaz. Boaz is referred to as our kinsman redeemer. We talk about pain and tragedy. And then we have Rahab. And, and Rahab is a Canaanite prostitute. Do you remember the story? She rescues Israelite spies in Jericho. But her life is a mess. She's a prostitute. And then Tamar, her life is marked with pain and suffering, and deceit, and somehow God uses every woman mentioned and every man mentioned whose lives are a mess, could even be said marked as failures, and God uses them to bring the Savior of the world for you and I. And so 
today the message is, is, is clear. Those who fail, those who have made mistakes, with a list like Matthew chapter 1, you're in good company. But it's so much more than that. Certainly can't be left at that. Here's the message. That apart from the grace of God, I would be nothing. Apart from the grace of God, you would be nothing. Apart from the grace of God, our lives would be meaningless. Romans chapter 12, verse 3 says, For by the grace given to me, Paul knew it well, by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should think. Think sensibly. Instead, think sensibly. As God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. I tell everyone, by the grace, I tell everyone not to think of himself more highly than he should think. How often, how often, man, we're, we got the, the stone, we picked it up and we are ready to throw. But when we pause and we're reminded that I should be the recipient of that stone, we're reminded that God's grace has been lavished upon me. That it's a gift that I've received that I didn't deserve. Oh, it transforms us. It transforms communities. When the church comes to the realization that apart from the grace of God, we are nothing and our life is meaningless. When we stop focusing on all the brokenness of our life and the mess we've made, and we start focusing on transfixing our eyes on Jesus, we start seeing how he puts the pieces of our life together. And then life becomes worth living for. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? All across this place, those that are joining us online, would you just take a moment and say, God, what is, what's my response to this? my response to this don't don't try to answer for the person next to you don't don't try to think of what's next later today but just for a moment would you just say god what is my response to this maybe the the moment that i talked about mistakes and failures and past maybe 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 that's all your focus right now and can i tell you that that is absolutely what the enemy wants you focused on. Can I just encourage you as you pray? Right where you're at, in the house, online. Can I just encourage you? Hey, would you surrender all of that over to the Lord Jesus? And allow him to fill you up with a future. He already has planned for you and I. And would you trust him for the future? Would you trust him for it? All across this place, people are praying. Online, people are praying. And I just wonder if there's one that's never surrendered over to the Lord, Jesus. I want you to know today that the Bible says today is the day of salvation. If that's you, you're struggling with where are you in your life? Can God really forgive my past? If I were to die right now, I don't know where I would spend eternity. Can I just encourage you? That your eternity, you, you can know, you can have confidence, not because of your goodness, but because of Christ Jesus and his goodness. Not because of anything that you've done right or will do right, but only because of his righteousness. And so those that are questioning today, would you surrender it all over to him? Would you come to the point where you say, Dear Jesus, I am a sinner. You are the Savior. I trust you from this day forward with my future. Forgive me completely of all my sins. I believe that you came to this earth, that you died on a cross. You were placed in a grave and you rose victorious 
from the grave for me. I believe in you. I trust you. My hope is in you. Thank you for saving me. If that's your prayer. Would you take a moment and just say thank you. Thank you, God, for saving me. For forgiving me. Take my life. Use it for your glory. Use it for your glory. In just a moment, we're going to sing. And as we sing, there's going to be some men and women at both corners, the front here, and in our next step area. And if you're struggling with something today, something's weighing heavy, would you have the courage to step out of your seat and move as the Spirit of God leads? If you need prayer today, would you have the courage to step out of your seat and allow somebody to pray with you? If you're questioning salvation, would you step out of your seat? Come and bring your questions surrender. Would you stand to your feet all across this place? Would you stand to your feet as we sing this song? Would you move as the Spirit of God leads you to move today?